great pleasure and honor to introduce Dr. Amber Haft, a research fellow from Sussex University, who is also a coordinator of a project about the tributary and more about that deals with futures and that also works on theory, value, commons, and closures, and other things that we're going to hear about tomorrow. Tonight, we're going to be focusing on a topic called real economics. I just wanted to say uh, and to welcome. And this is for all of the people who might be watching us on YouTube right now and who will be watching us on YouTube. Welcome, this is an organ social training, our visiting actor series, and this is an end right now. <laughs> Very much for that introduction and for the invitation. I'm really happy to be here tonight. Um, like Andre said, my name is Amber Hoff. Um, I'm a research fellow at the Institute of Development Studies at the University of Sussex, um, and I'm a coordinator of an initiative called the Center for Future Natures. And what we do is we use arts and storytelling and research and bring them all together to look at the politics of crisis, enclosure, commoning, but really to, to look at you know, existing possibilities um, uh, in the making for future and you know, future natures. Um, and yeah, today I'm going to be talking about great ecologies. Um, this is kind of a, a side project that developed um, with my colleague um, Adrian Nell at the University of KwaZulu Natal and also um, in collaboration with Tim Zucco, who's a comic book creator um, who works with Future Natures. Um, we make comics, um, futurenatures.org. They're available in the PDF if you'd like to check them out. And we do have one on green ecology specifically. Um, yeah, and this is a project that uh, it really started um, to see for planning in 2020, um, but it really kind of um, blossomed during the pandemic. Um, a time that was undoubtedly good for a lot of us. Um, the motivation was really um, around finding new ways of seeing and communicating and producing knowledge about our encounters in nature um, and, and thinking about the, the different ways that we use storytelling, whether we're researchers, whether we're um, people exploring strange earthly ecologies, um, how we communicate about that, and how we bring together people in the center. Um, so colonialism, imperialism, capitalist globalization, um, these are just economic processes, of course. They transform ecologies and material landscapes, and they set in motion profound processes of disordering and change that are adverse, dramatic, interconnected, and far-reaching. They ripple across scales with consequences that are uneven, uncertain, and often irreversible. These processes and ruptures don't just affect the environment around us. They can warp the ways that we sense, the ways that we experience, and the ways that we situate the relationships between our bodies, our social selves, and more than human nature. For example, Bruce Braun and colleagues described the Bakken oil fields in North Dakota, one of the most <clears throat> important sources of new oil production in the United States from about 2006 to 2012, um, and an epicenter for the deployment of new extractive technologies like um, hydraulic fracturing or fracking, as a place of stratigraphic disordering, where surface and depth, past and present, inside and outside are folded together, producing new subjectivities, new economies, and new natures. And the Singh writes of such global landscapes as eerie, strewn with the ruins left behind by distraction, haunted not only by the ghosts of alienated people and natures, but also forms of power and imagined futures, contested dream worlds of progress. The stories we tell about our world matter. One dominant story of global environmental change and its associated framings that emphasize global aggregates, planetary thresholds, and the destructiveness of the generalized humanity are a case in point, I think. The story of planetary crisis is a productive politics, and it works to abstract and perceptually disembed crisis from place and experience, from its generative, material, and social relations and contradictions, 
as well as from our embodied experience as earthly creatures. These findings of crisis construct what Timothy Morton calls hyperobjects. Uh, hyperobjects are problems that are constructed in, in such a way as to be so big and so complicated and so really intellectually paralyzing that they really foreclose on social imagination and undermine the ability of people to feel like they have agency in a change and changing world. This productive and effective politics is disorienting because it disrupts our accustomed ways of perceiving time, space, scale, and causality. And it creates a perceptual slippage between concrete experience and virtual representations of crisis. Confusion between the after, the action, and the after the plan. Between a sense of control and fear of an uncertain future. The effective responses to this are disorientation, They've been described as eco-anxiety, soul nostalgia, ecological grief, a sense of disjunction, separation between our earthly selves and external nature. Many of us no longer find ourselves capable of believing in the innocence of the sensual world that surrounds us. The shadows creep in and we feel something reaching for us. The problems are wicked and reality is terrifying. In short, for many people, the world has become weird. My co-authors and I, I think that such a shared sense of disorientation in part explains the spectral turn of the eco-humanities and particularly a renaissance of the weird in recent years. Its elements and imagery feature not only in its classic domains of pulp fiction, film, and visual art, but also as an analytic and cultural theory, philosophy, eco-criticism, and the social sciences, and even nature journalism. Global weirding has become a, a common alternative to global warming among many climate journalists and climate scientists, used to emphasize that we're living in post-normal times as a prognosis for the extremes and extreme uncertainties that we face in a time of prolonged environmental crisis and change. So what is the weird? The weird is defined by its affect. It arrives by an uncanny aesthetic creating a sensation of disorientation in the reader. This most often hinges upon a character and the reader noticing the differences between two or more worlds in an ontological sense, existing in superposition or entangled in the same or contiguous spaces. The weird is often queer. Materialities of the weird are expressed in imaginative ecologies that play on and with scientific taxonomies and common sense differences between biological taxa, states of matter, um, human and other. This decenters the human subject and unsettles binary modes of perception by which we distinguish between us and them, natural and human worlds. Like Alice falling down the rabbit hole, these worlds are often traversed by portals, gateways, processes of unveiling. These could be literal gateways or doors, but the weird tale often relies on a recounting or first person narrative. Storytelling itself can arguably be the most powerful means of unveiling or moving between worlds in the weird tale. And this involves characters internal to the tale, but it's reproduced in the relationship between the reader and the writer. As with Donna Haraway's conceptualization of tentacular thinking, the weird is storytelling that extends possibilities, disrupts the rational, and makes, quote, human exceptionalism and bounded individualism those old saws of Western philosophy and political economics become unthinkable. It opens space for both deep critique and a potentially expanded sense of what sorts of entanglements and kinships the material cosmos might contain. People are most uh, familiar probably with the Lovecraftian weird, also called cosmic horror. Um, most people have been exposed probably by a pop culture. This is the, the weird slime, tentacles, old castles, and Hulu. H.P. Lovecraft is almost universally credited with the formalization of the weird as a quasi-genre, and his style of cosmic horror has had a vast influence on art, literature, and philosophy. Lovecraft was, as many of us know, a really vile person. He was a racist and misogynist in his own life, um, and this is really evident in most of his writing. He's been called um, the original incel. Um, so it makes sense that some people might too easily dismiss the weird, or at least the cosmic weird, as a stand-in for the white supremacist, masculinist, sociopath's existential fear of the other and hidden things within the self. But Lovecraft didn't invent the weird. 
long before his elder gods and elder quarters, writers like Mary Shelley, Edgar Allan Poe, H.G. Wells, and Ambrose Bierce worked with aesthetic, atmospheric, and philosophical elements that will come to define the coordinates of the weird. Fairy stories, folk tales, myths from oral and written traditions from around the world explore the weird, and uncanny realms, music in or alongside our own. These are the caves, the forests, the waters, the misty twilights. These are all enchanted borderlands and everyday portals to the weird. In this way, the weird has always been with us. The Lovecraftian weird is cosmic horror. It valorizes the past, where the unknown is vast, incomprehensible, and indifferent to humanity's um, existence. This creates a sense of existential terror and dread in storytelling. Um, in the Lovecraftian weird, Ambivalence is mostly about tension between fascination with the unknown and the horror of realizing humanity's insignificance. Now, there's also um, what has been called the new weird, and this is kind of a contested category, but it's a more contemporary manifestation of the weird, and this is authors like Jeff Vandermeer, China Mielville, um, Octavia Butler. Um, and for the new weird, the weird is transgressive, and ambivalence is more about the indeterminacy of the weird how the strange might be both terrifying and transformative. It might be grotesque and awe-inspiring. Fear coexists with wonder in these stories, and revulsion with fascination. The ambivalence here comes from the fact that the strange is both disruptive and potentially transformative. Thus, the weird can be a source of fear and avoidance, or of giving over and re-enchantment in a disenchanted and overly rationalized world. How weirding and weird encounters affect us and change us as real people um, very much depends on how one is primed to react in the face of difference and uncertainty. How one responds to the certainty that they're no longer in control. And whether giving over to the inevitability of life in a changed and changing world, um, and sometimes terrifying world, implies a descent into madness as it would in cosmic horror or acceptance of the possibilities of transformation. So in this work that I'm going to be talking about um, today, we use the term weird ecology in two parallel ways. First, <clears throat> to describe an analytic approach that brings together elements of the literary weird with radical ecology, and particularly social ecology and political ecology. Second, we use it to describe modes of encounter that are experienced through noticings and unveilings that are outside of ordinary perception or at least ordinary expectations. We see weird ecologies and weird encounters as occurring in the, in the perceptual borderlands that lie between a cosmos that's pacified and disenchanted through an increasingly rationalizing quest for efficiency and control, which is exemplified in the techno-bureaucratic developmentalism that we see pervading politics. Um, and a cosmos where the enchantment is possible, where the humans be centered but not erased. We ask, can encounters and storytelling that embrace ecological difference and meaningful intimacies with the weird in nature nourish new kinships and new ways of commenting our relations with the other? So in our research, we've used weird ecology as a lens specifically for exploring the effective and embodied practices and methods um, that seek re-enchantment through encounter with earthly difference. Specifically, since 2020, a major focus of our research has been methods of, quote, underwater tracking and multi-species storytelling of the Sea Change Project, um, which is a group of artists, writers, scientists, and filmmakers who have spent thousands of hours skin diving and breath hole diving without wetsuits or oxygen tanks um, in the icy cold waters um, of the so-called Great African Kelp Forest off the Western Cape in South Africa. Through daily dives, practices of deduction, ritual, storytelling, and seeking out encounter in the forest under the waves, their efforts have been greeted with remarkable and transformative insights for the group. Um, these have deeply affected them, as well as audiences of their approach to storytelling that a colleague once called transformational weirding. I'm using um, a lot of these images um, that are hand-drawn. These are by Tim Zocco, who is the product creator that we've worked with. He's come from the Weird Ecologies comic that we published in 2020, by the way. 
Um, at the root of Sea Change's approach is the careful, embodied, and sensorial exploration of the kelp forest, not as professional ecologists collecting specimens, but exploration based on sensorial cues, subtle noticings that allow them to cognitively understand patterns, intersections, and untangle webs of relationships, including what they describe as a rediscovery of their own connections to the sea and to more the human ecologies therein. Rather than fearing and avoiding encounter with difference, sea change embraces the earthly weird. And this is um, uh, titled uh, Trapping Underwater, but it's an illustration, not by Tim Zaku, um, of a mental map that one of the members of sea change named Craig Foster um, produced based on his experiences in the, in the kelp forest. In 2020, Craig Foster, who um, was behind that mental map, described his motivation as part of sea change. He said, we've broken the strings to the wild. It's my job to fix some of those strings, to build a pathway back to the wild, the wild in our hearts and in our minds. I'm hunting wilderness, I'm hunting my deep ancestors, and I'm hunting the secret lives of the magnificent non-human people in the kelp. I'm searching for the wonder that lies in all of those things. In this weird underwater ecology, they practice collective arts of noticing and <clears throat> noticing and storing, what they call living science. Noticings, unveilings, encounters are their method of collaborative underwater tracking. Their experience aims at the search for what they call primal joy, which is based on nurturing cross-species kinships, uh, based on familiarization and respect and represents something of a re-enchantment and ontological shift where the border separating worlds, this time the terrestrial and the aquatic, the human from the animal, the now from deep history, seems to dissolve in their experience. This is where enchantment and primal joy are found by the group. Craig, who is himself a filmmaker, um, recalls Bushman cave paintings which depicted ropes, cords, threads, and lines of light that enable spiritual healers to connect with other animals, um, but also that form ropes that connect people and animals to God. Um, and this helps, uh, sorry, this helps in communication, <clears throat> sorry, um, from this perspective, this helps in communication with other commu between communities. Um, this idea of these ropes and cords to God is reminiscent of cave paintings where in this image you see the red lines connecting people to animals. But it's also resonant with Donna Haraway's Cat's Cradles. Both of these things highlight tracing, the tracing of complex interconnections and also transliminality. Craig said, when you look at an octopus, it appears to be completely alien, but you're act actually looking at yourself. You're woven from the same fabric and you can make a connection and it brings you closer to oneness. Regarding um, story, storytelling methods using film, photography, and through journalistic writing, um, Foster's partner said that they were having deeply powerful experiences in the wild, but that this was proving difficult to convey to viewers who didn't have a similar frame of reference or have similar experiences. So the group realized that the best way to get the power of these experiences across was to tell stories in the most emotive and authentic way that they could, um, seeking emotional connection between the viewer and the natural world. And um, one mechanism that they picked up on for doing this quite well um, is the creation of non-proximal encounter, um, which is basically just a fancy way of describing um, creating kind of a remote encounter between a distant audience and the subject of a story. Um, the 2020 um, Oscar-winning Netflix documentary My Octopus Teacher is an example of the group's approach to multi-species storytelling. They use captivating imagery to create these non-proximal effective encounters between the audience and the kelp forest to tell stories in which multi-species players are enmeshed in partial and flawed translations across difference, across life and death. Um, in this film, um, who many, many of you may have seen, um, the film presents the story of Craig Foster, 
um, who over the course of a year of daily free diving um, enters into an octopus's world. Um, he has an intense and intimate friendship with an octopus and becomes part of the story of life and death in the kelp forest, leading to personal transformation in his own life and a, sense of, a, a deeper sense of being in nature. Um, this documentary, um, working with people who made it, has been very interesting because um, you know, any of us who are artists or filmmakers know that like, once you create something and put it out there for the world, you're no longer in control of how it's interpreted or read or digested. It becomes kind of a cultural object that gets back all around. Um, and, but, but also like looking at it as a cultural object has been a very interesting way to explore kind of the impacts of their tentacular storytelling approach um, and their encounters with weird ecologies in the broader public. So um, one thing that we've done is we've looked through quite a bit of social media um, response to the film, um, as well as emails that have been received by the, the filmmaking team, the Sea Chain as a group, um, and also looked at broader kind of cultural references to the film to understand better um, responses to this like non-proximal, effective, encounter-based storytelling. Um, so responses to the film's release, um, oh, I'll just say, like, the film's <laughs> release happened. <laughs> it, it, that film came in September of 2020, which was um, a time where many people were experiencing like peak lockdown fatigue. Um, it was kind of the film everyone needed. Um, beautiful imagery, take you to a place that's not your flat um, or your living room. You know, through the, the laptop screen or the television screen, and it was um, it was an unexpected like big hit. Um, so responses have been very positive but very differentiated, and we're interested in, in the kind of range of responses. But of course, there was like a slew of satire, and I remember the <laughs> when my creepy creepy crawling teacher who was the first. Um, satire that I saw, it came out just like days after the film was released, but it, it tells the intimate relationship between a man and his um, robotic pool cleaner. Um, <laughs> <laughs> then later, um, it, anybody like documentary now? Um, it was my monkey grifter. Who's <laughs> 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 um, a fan of the boys? Anybody know what I'm talking about? Yeah. So the, the actual relationship between the deep and his octopus girlfriend was directly inspired by my octopus teacher. This has been confirmed by the showrunners. Um, so this is a new addition to the talk. <laughs> um, so that's just, that's just a few examples um, of the, the satirical responses, which tend to be in quite good nature. Um, some people really, really embraced the weird encounter that the story offered and responded with very strong emotions, very, very intense emotions of love or other connection to the octopus as an individual or to the story of weird friendship. Some people were so moved that they found themselves like crying all night, feeling emotions that had become unfamiliar due to depression and burnout. Um, people, people were enraged um, because there's one scene in the film where the octopus is attacked by a pajama shark, and um, the human, Craig Foster, sees this happen but doesn't interfere. People were enraged with him, that how dare you not help your friend? Um, and, and he was you know, talking about some like idea of, you know, oh, I'm just a visitor here, I'm stepping back. And you know, people were not happy with that answer. Um, so yeah, th these were like quite intense responses. Um, lots of people swore off of sushi. Um, <laughs> My Octopus Teacher is one of the most stunning pieces of art I've ever seen. I'm dead inside. Um, even I felt a range of emotions watching this story unfold. Um, this is the most beautiful thing I have seen in a long time from Zach Braff. Um, beautiful, moving, and inspiring. It makes one realize that you're not an outsider or a visitor, but part of a much bigger and complex network may teach viewers to be less arrogant and more respectful and appreciative of nature and its wonders. 
Some of the most interesting public response to this film is a cultural object bouncing around in the universe. Um, was in reaction to a Twitter review penned by a well-known queer feminist writer, geographer, and journalist known for her writing on cyborg ecology, family abolition, and reproductive politics, um, who has, she's written of her own effective experiences in nature, including having very satisfying sex with a lady on one occasion. Um, and she had watched the documentary with friends while tripping on acid on a rainy night under lockdown. Um, and the review began the description of the documentary as the moving story about, quote, a straight man who has a life-changing erotic relationship with a female octopus. <laughs> Before then, the thread took a deep dive into what another aptly referred to as octopus queer theory, exploring the boundary dissolving and alien intimacies and the sliding suctions of octopus eros. <laughs> um, this review sparked something already brewing in the Twitter cultural soup around the film <laughs> that quickly escalated into what was described as a cephalopod sex panic. <laughs> it became known in some circles as octopus gate. This itself generated a range of response then, from indignation that what most people you know, saw as such a wholesome film would be seen in such terms, to accusations of erasing or sidestepping the politics of apartheid and how it unevenly and violently affected people's relationships with the sea by censoring the experiences of a cis pet white South African man, <laughs> to accusations of bestiality and the propagation of rumors that the film involved actual multi species sex acts. <laughs> Different types of. <laughs> These are real. <laughs> reaction map on to the weird and thinking around weird ecologies in different ways. Just to give a little bit of context, the film with the knife handle here, this was like a 20 minute video of the guy just flipping the knife handle in his hand and talking about the film. Um, and then he said, we had to stop halfway through because he was getting a little <laughs> Watching a guy Bleep an octopus every day for over 300 days was both weird and interesting. <laughs> Hashtag my octopus teacher. Dude, same. I was like, I cannot be the only one that feels like he's sexualizing their relationship. <laughs> okay, gonna be real here. As beautifully shot as it was, my octopus teacher left me feeling really uncomfortable. <laughs> He never really mentions his wife <laughs> after the first few minutes. <laughs> Encountering weird ecologies through this approach to storytelling can evoke strange interpretations and strong negative reactions, including, of course, discomfort, revulsion, accusations of, quote, perversion, and bestiality. And yeah, these weren't the only ones. This was a, a much less common response than the, you know, deep emotional love of octopi and swearing off of sushi. But it was definitely noticeable, especially among more kind of conservative online um, commentators. <laughs> um, but what was causing this sort of response? Like, I thought it was really interesting and intriguing thing to think about. So, Lewitz, who pinned the original Twitter thread that sparked Octopus Gate, um, and others have drawn attention to parallels between developing real intimacies in nature and the breaking down of boundaries between worlds, comparing, um, for example, the world of the fictional shell diver in Hokusai's famous 1814 erotic painting to Craig Foster's description of a moment in the film when his octopus friend nestled unafraid on his chest. Quote, the boundaries between her and I seem to dissolve. And in the text with the, the photo, uh, the shell diver says, boundaries and borders gone have vanished. Um, Lewis points out how just as the shell diver's intimacy was a horror and a tragedy to the gaze of 19th century white people, um, intensely negative reactions to the intimate friendship between a human and an octopus might say a lot about the politics of the current juncture especially tensions between reactionary politics seeking to 
reinstate an imagined golden age of white masculine human supremacy and control, and efforts to rethink and rework our relationships with nature in a fundamentally changed and changing world. So this is still a work in progress, um, but just to conclude, we see really contested responses to what we consider to be sea changes of weird ecology um, and their approach to storytelling based on weird encounter and in intimacies. And we see these to reflect deeper underlying cultural politics, including contestations around binary ways of thinking, um, proper human nature relationships, and multi-species kinships. This indicates that embodied experience and interspecies learning conveyed through effective storytelling can be a possibly um, a powerful and possibly re-enchanting vehicle to help others see the world and their place in it in new ways. But it can also be mapping onto you know, the cosmic horror of the Lovecraftian weird, a source of fear and avoidance reflective of deeper conflicts and contradictions in the dominant cultural construction around the proper ordering of social and natural hierarchies, including the rejection of difference. Um, 